Our reading from the scriptures today comes from the Gospel of John, the very first chapter of John, the first 18 verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the Word, and without the Word, nothing came into being. What came into being through the Word was life, and the life was the light for all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't extinguish the light. A man named John was sent from God. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him everyone would believe in the light. He himself wasn't the light, but his mission was to testify concerning the light. The true light that shines on all people was coming into the world. The light was in the world, and the world came into being through the light, but the world didn't recognize the light. The light came to his own people, and his own people didn't welcome him. But those who did welcome him, those who believed in his name, he authorized to become God's children, born not from blood, nor from human desire or passion, but born from God. The Word became flesh and made his home among us. We have seen his glory, glory like that of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified about him, crying out, This is the one of whom I said, He who comes after me is greater than me because he existed before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. As the law was given through Moses, so grace and truth came into being through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, God the only Son, who is at the Father's side, has made God known. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Once in a while, I will have somebody tell me something, and I will wish that they had not told me because I begin to, begin to wonder why they told me. I, I know it's harder and harder every day to receive information in its purest form without questioning the motive of the teller. Just this week, I, I was having a conversation with a friend who who, like me, shares concerns about, about the state of things in our country and the world, our, our divisions. My friend was expressing his general suspicions of the, of the genuineness of those on all sides of the various issues. Sometimes we don't feel like we can get the truth because everyone who's sharing the information has their own agenda and thus their own bias. It is not so different with the Bible, including the story of Jesus. We have before us in the Bible four different tellings of the story. Matthew told it, Mark told it, Luke told it, and John, several decades later than the other three, tells the story. They each tell it in their own way, including within their telling some information and excluding leaving out other information. For example, the Christmas details of the story only make it into two of the four Gospels, Matthew and Luke. Matthew gives us details of Jesus' birth, starting with a page or more of begats from Ancestry.com. This is where Jesus came from. These are his people. And interestingly enough, Matthew traces Jesus' family back through the lineage of his non-biological earthly father, Joseph. Matthew wants us to know Jesus through Joseph's people, all the way back to David, King David. This is what, led, this is what has led many 
who study the Gospels to conclude that Matthew was trying to bring Jesus to early Jewish Christians. Luke, on the other hand, gives much more attention to Mary in the story of Jesus' birth, letting us know that Jesus came from humble beginnings, a poor peasant girl singled out by the angel to be mother to the Son of God. Luke wants us to know that Jesus came into the world as the underdog Messiah and as Messiah to the underdogs of the world. Why is Luke telling us this story in this way? Luke seems to want us to know that, that God does have favorites. God is definitely on the side of the underdog. Samaritans and women caught in sin and tax collectors and children and poor people and the mentally ill. Mark, on the other hand, begins his gospel after Jesus starts his public ministry. Mark does not feel the need to weigh his story down with a, with a let's start from the very beginning biography. Mark wants us to focus on the actions of Jesus. This is what Jesus did more than what he said about himself. In fact, Mark tells us that Jesus tried his best to keep his biographical details a secret, knowing that if folks started focusing on them, they might miss his call to follow him through their own actions. And like Mark, the writer of today's gospel also did not give us an old little town of Bethlehem away in the manger, angels we've heard on high Christmas story. But when it comes to Jesus, John does give us a story of beginnings, a beginning that goes much further back than any of the other gospel writers, back way before Bethlehem and Mary and Joseph, way before even King David or Father Abraham or a Jewish nation or a Hebrew people, way before even Adam and Eve. John says, Jesus was at the very beginning, before even the Big Bang, or the stars formed, or the waters separated from the firmament. John uses some lofty philosophical language to say that in the beginning, before everything was something, there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Why is John telling us this? Why this story in this way? Who is John's audience? What group is John looking out for, or trying to convince, or trying to give special privilege to? Who is John telling us Jesus belongs to? Who does John say belong to God? You know, from the first Sunday we started this church, I've begun nearly every service with a question. Who are we? And the answer that I've asked you to give back, the answer I've trained you to give back is, we are all God's children. Now, on those few Sundays I've forgotten to, to ask the question, someone has use, usually reminded me. I so much miss Joe Hook. He always would remind me. One of the many things I hate about our current distance from one another is that I can't hear you give back that answer. I have to assume that in your PJs from your easy chair, you are shouting out, we are all God's children. I had someone challenge that answer one day. This person said, well, that's not true. We're not all God's children. Those who've yet to confess their beliefs in a certain way, well, they're not God's children. That person doesn't come here anymore, but, but I recognize that his theology is not uncommon. I think it's wrong, but it's not un uncommon. John introduces Jesus to us on a cosmic stage. He identifies Jesus 
as the eternal logos from the Greek meaning word, the one who was and is and has been and ever will be, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. John says Jesus is at the very core of the divine force of creation and love that drives everything there is or ever has been or ever will be. It all belongs to God, John says. We all belong to God. Before God was, there was not anything. And after God is, there will not be anything. God is love, and that love will not be manipulated by anything, by you or I or anyone else. That's the theology of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Those words would have rung with truth to John's audience. It's the next statement that I highlight that John makes, which may create a problem for some folks. And the word became flesh. Why, it's a killer punchline that the sophisticated and the powerful and the prestigious and the somebodies of this world may have a problem with, the word becoming flesh. And just what is the problem that much of the world has with the word becoming flesh? First, flesh cannot be controlled. Now a word, a message contained within a book, well that can be controlled. A word or a message limited to a philosophy can be molded or, or shaped to fit our needs, to say what we want it to say. A word or a message put forth in a newspaper or a magazine or throughout the various means of social media can be manipulated and managed, but a word or a message that becomes flesh has a life and a mind and a mouth of its own and speaks for itself. It's the difference between, between a baby doll and a flesh and blood baby. Now much of the world wants a baby doll Jesus for Christmas. The world wants a Jesus that we can dress up and, and lay in a cradle and step back from and, and gaze upon and say, well, ain't he cute? Isn't he darling, my sweet little Jesus boy? We want a Jesus we can, we can sing about and study and preach about that walks and talks and thinks just like us. We want a Jesus that belongs to us, not the other way around, one to whom we belong. We want a baby doll, Jesus. But the Bible says the Word didn't come as a baby doll. The Word became flesh. And flesh cannot be controlled. Babies cannot be controlled. If you've ever had one, you know that. And the older they get, the less control we have over them. Babies cry when they want to cry, they coo when they want to coo, they eat when they want to eat, and they do other things when they want to do other things. And as those babies grow up, well, they walk where they want to walk, and they say what they want to say, and they do what they want to do. Flesh cannot be controlled. And the Word of God, John says, has become flesh. And the Word will not be controlled by us, or by those who think they are in control. And it does not matter whether your address is 1600 South Main Street, Anderson, South Carolina, or 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, D.C., the Word of God will not be controlled by you. And I would imagine that if you lived at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, D.C., it would be hard not to think that you were in control. After all, you've got your finger, so to speak, on the button. By your word, armies march, and the stock market goes up and down, and the economy rises and falls. But the word of God, what God has to say is not and will not be controlled by anyone. For the word has become flesh. And the sophisticated and the powerful of our world wherever their seats of power may be, 
are more than a little uncomfortable with the notion that someone beyond them may truly be in control. But that's the message of Christmas. The Word of God has become flesh and will not be controlled, will not be manipulated to say anything other than what God Almighty wants that word to say. The other problem that the world has with the word is not only has the word become flesh, but John says the word has moved into the neighborhood. The word has come to live among us. Now, 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 for some people in this world, that reality is a frightening proposition. There goes the neighborhood, so to speak, because you see, the word will not be gated in. And who has the word, or who the word brings into the neighborhood, will not be managed. And the word will go into neighborhoods that those outside that neighborhood might find undesirable. And the word will dwell there. And the word will transform lives there. And the word will call to those who are living in the neighborhoods we like to call more desirable. The word will call to those of us, bring all that I've given you. Help meet human needs in the places where I've pitched my tent. And if we don't come to those parts of town, the word says we'll be sent away with all the rest of the goats who just didn't get the word. The message of this Christmas is that the word of God is dwelling among us. The word of God has moved into this neighborhood. And that word is not just for those of us who associate our lives with a building, a church building that we call God's house. That word is for every house on every block, on every street, from the church house to the schoolhouse to the courthouse to the crack house. Now reality is that some of those dwelling in some of those houses will not welcome the word because you see the word is the light of life and we all know what light does. It takes away the darkness. And if we are living in sin or making our living in sin, we like to hide in the darkness. But perhaps, perhaps if we, if we would be the light, someone who's living in that darkness, if we would testify to the light, I should say, maybe someone who's living in that darkness, maybe even we ourselves, would come to that light. That's our challenge this morning, to testify to the light. Will we testify to the light? Has the light shined into our darkness? And if it has, what difference has it made in our lives? God has called us to be bearers of the light we testify to the light when we allow the light to shine through us. In a world so often clouded under the darkness of selfishness and greed and suspicion and resentment and anger and bitterness and pride and envy and fear, the only way anything is going to change, says this book, is for us to let the light shine through us. Oh, I know that tape which runs through most of our heads. What kind of light can I be? What kind of difference can I make? Well, I, I'm just one person. I, I, I don't have any title. I don't have any position. I don't have any power. And God says back to us, I know you don't. But I do. And I have become flesh. In you, I've become flesh. And my light can shine overcoming the dark. So in this Christmas leading to Epiphany season, watch, be on the watch. For the word has become flesh and has moved into the neighborhood. 
Watch out, world. Let's pray together. Let your light shine in us and through us is our prayer of commitment this day, God. In your name we pray. Amen.